While there are plenty of pieces of missing anime content from across the web that need to be found, to be honest, most of it comes from things no one really cares about. But once in a while, something goes missing from a show that's very popular. In this case, we'll be discussing all the cases of this across the South Park brand. In 1997, a show premiered on the at the time small cable network of Comedy Central that revolved around the lives of four grade school boys in a small town in Colorado. As you probably already know, this cartoon has gone on to be one of the most famous television programs of all time. South Park was started in the very early days of the internet, a time before we had video streaming and most had to deal with the slow speeds of dial-up. Because of this, the show was picked up after the original short was spread across the United States through a copy on VHS. Because of their unusual start in show business, it's no surprise that the show's creators, Matt Stone and Trey Parker, have never been very traditional in their treatment of the South Park brand. Them pushing the limits with censors, video games, and the wild west of the internet have led to much of their content becoming lost. So let's take a look at some cases of this. Because of the show's harsh satirical takes on very controversial subject matters, them pushing the limits has on occasion led to censorship, which with the most infamous incident relating to the season 5 episode, Super Best Friends. Because of threats from Islamic extremist groups, the episode was banned as it included a depiction of Muhammad working alongside prophets of other religions. To counter this decision, South Park's creators decided that they would celebrate their 200th episode milestone by directly addressing the prophet's immunity from free speech. In a two-part storyline split between episode 200 and 201, celebrities that the show has parodied in the previous episodes would seek the same sort of protection as Muhammad, and the episode would end with a meta tongue-in-cheek speech about how violence was the solution. Unfortunately, this episode was ironically subjugated to even more censorship from executives who, you know, were worried that the terrorists would come in and attack their headquarters as some sort of retribution. When the episode was finally greenlit to air, Sound Bleep censored any utterance of the Prophet's name, and the aforementioned speech jokingly advocating for violence was removed entirely. Because it was so over the top, many were quick to pass this off as some sort of joke. But the creators Matt Stone and Trey Parker came out later to clarify publicly that this had been done without their approval. This decision was criticized heavily by audiences, since the terrorist group that had threatened Comedy Central had been labeled as being not a threat by the FBI. For years, no one knew what the speech at the end of the episode was supposed to be, until it was leaked in 2014. As it turns out, for some reason, the uncensored cut of the episode had been hosted on the South Park database online, and it was able to be illegally ripped by a user on 4chan. Upon release, this mistake was quickly fixed, but luckily, the audio still remains in circulation for any diehard fans of the show to find. Until recently, the 1998 online-only South Park short A Mother's Courage was thought to have been lost forever. Produced to complement the similarly themed Halloween episode, it was a short 90-second clip of the boys demonstrating how to carve a jack-o'-lantern. It ran off a small 50 kilobyte file titled SouthPark.MCS and was created using the now extremely obscure Media Conveyor, which at the time was meant to be a competitor to Macromedia Flash. The Media Conveyor was chosen because it was able to successfully recreate the South Park style relatively well, while also requiring very small downloads. This was a necessity in 1998, where it was difficult to get audio and visual elements properly synchronized for the average consumers with extremely low bandwidth. Furthermore, the program used a cache system for its assets, meaning that if you downloaded the elements of a South Park protagonist once, you would never have to re-download them again for different shorts. Of course, as we all know now, Macromedia Flash won the fight by a landslide, so Comedy Central scrapped all plans to produce more South Park episodes and shorts using the software. In fact, they went as far as to remove the only short they produced as well and replaced A Mother's Courage with a three-page comic depicting the same storyline. Hence why it was thought to be lost. For years, people thought that it was wiped clean off the internet forever, and there was little to no documentation about it. 
This all changed though in October of 2015 when a YouTuber named Manis uploaded his copy to YouTube. We're going to demonstrate how to carve one to look exactly like Lou Diamond Stella. Lou Diamond Stella. Woohoo! Yeah, 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 you guys. The best part about Halloween is candy con. You shouldn't need all that, Carmen. You're gonna get sick. Ah, go to hell. Anyway, to make a Lou Diamond Stella's jack o' lantern, the first thing you need is a very sharp knife. <laughs> Cut the top of the pumpkin off. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, South Park's lost media isn't limited only to animation. And with the upcoming release of the new South Park video game, it seems like now is a good time to go through some other complimentary South Park material that seemed to have gone lost. And what better place to start than with the first South Park video game ever made? Planned to be released at around the same time as their first person shooter for the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1, the first South Park game ever was a platformer for the Game Boy Color. It was being developed by Acclaim and made it to completion. In fact, it got so far into development that plans for its distribution were already being drawn out, and it was even being advertised in an issue of Nintendo Power. The reason it was cancelled wasn't because of a developmental reason. Instead, it was because of a moral decision. The Game Boy Color was marketed towards children, and since South Park has such an inappropriate sense of humor, its release could have caused controversy among parents and activists, resulting in a PR nightmare. This combined with the fact that its art style might have led to more confusion with a younger demographic caused its release to be called off by the creators. The game did eventually get released, although with an entirely new asset and branding. Believe it or not, the game was reskinned for very little kids in Europe where it was released under the name Maya and the Bee, and in the US under the name The New Adventures of Mary-Kate and Ashley. This situation actually reminds me of the Crazy Castle series from its gameplay, the fact that it's also a Game Boy series, and most importantly that it swapped around the intellectual property used depending on the region. I actually made a video about the series years ago if you want to check it out. One more infamous cancelled South Park game was the one being developed by Buzz Monkey Software for the Xbox, PlayStation, and GameCube. To be honest, I'm sure most of you have at least vaguely heard of it at this point. Discovered last year by the YouTuber Happy Console Gamer, it received widespread attention throughout the gaming community after being found on an Xbox dev kit. Described as being similar to Grand Theft Auto and The Simpsons hit and run gameplay, it was an open world project where players could solve puzzles, collect items, and complete story related missions and quests. It featured not only the four main boys as playable characters, but other fan favorites such as Chef and Mr. Slave. It's also notable for being the first attempt at mapping out the show's town. Unlike the Game Boy Color game, this was actually cancelled for developmental reasons. The team was simply too inexperienced, there was a lot of in-house drama with the producers at Ubisoft, and many of the deadlines went unsatisfied. So, much to many South Park fans' disappointment, it was ultimately axed, and went unnoticed by the public until a demo was leaked in 2016. A full breakdown of what was available in the demo is available in this video by Unseen64. The final game I'd like to cover in this video is 2014 South Park The Stick of Truth. Well, yes, it was released. If you had kept up with its development since the beginning, you'd have caught on that its plot and scope had changed vastly since its start. In fact, the original trailer for the game details a much more dysphoric plot, involving more characters from the actual show and a grander sense of scale. Firstly, I'd like to point you to this trailer from E3 2012. In it, Cartman lists out a general outline of how the storyline would go. The first antagonist in the beginning of the game would be the Goblins, which appear to be a scrap faction from the game. They would have a battle with the Elves at Stark Pond. Unlike the final version of the game, from this trailer it seems that the main four boys of the show would have kept together and remained one party, as opposed to forming two rivaling parties. Cartman states that the next opponents to come were the Garden Gnomes, which evidence from the concept art were planned to have had their own facilities to explore and interact with. After the gnomes, there were the vampire kids, who were shown fighting the main characters in the land of the death. Both the cemetery and the vampire kids still exist in the game's data, with lines of code stating that they would drop assorted Hot Topic accessories. Footage of them fighting the protagonist to keep them away from the monster lab is available in the early trailers as well. 
The crab people were almost definitely going to play a large role in the game at one point. With their communities and buildings seemingly having been interspersed with the minds of the underpants gnomes. In all the footage seen of them, they are depicted as being taller than the main characters, likely similar to the final game's mechanic of gnome dust. Their inclusion is still evident in the game's files, with Crab King having unused Facebook icons. Interestingly enough, in beta versions of the game, the underpants gnomes and the crab people share Facebook icons. More proof of this concept is seen in the image Crab City, which is labeled as both crab and gnome. All of the factions described by Cartman are strangely still seen in the entrance of Clyde's fortress in the final game, despite never being fought or even encountered earlier. While it's fun to sit here and ponder what could have been with all this missing South Park content, you also have to keep in mind that the creators of the show have stated that much of this scrap material ended up getting reused somewhere else later on down the line. So in that way, none of it really has gone missing, it was just reused somewhere else. And with that note, I think I'll end the video here. So until next time, thank you for watching.